so we will move from the uh, from new world order and geopolitics back to uh, the much more exciting world of uh, of data and what you can do with this. Uh, so our objective for uh, for this session is to really look a bit deeper at some of the underlying technologies related to the data. We had a lot already today covered, uh, so I hope we can build up on the earlier on the earlier discussions we had. Why don't we start with a quick round of intros, your company, what you do. Uh, Michael. Uh, my name is Michael Corby. I am uh, the head of market data at Ballyazny Asset Management. So, um, that, is, that is how you pronounce it. Um, uh, we are a multi-strategy hedge fund based in Chicago um, uh, with a large presence uh, here in New York. Um, and um, we're focused, um, well, my focus is uh, bringing in data into the firm. Uh, across the spectrum of data, for, um, bread and butter kind of market data, both live and historically, as well as um, all other kind of reference data, fundamentals, alternative data as well. Um, anything that uh, brings in data for investment professionals to use um, is, is part of our domain. Um, and uh, to that effect, we have a, a pipeline of data and a, a, a pipeline of um, t a mechanism of ensuring that everything we're seeing is uh, being delivered in compliance with uh, uh, exchange rules and, and things like that. So you'll, you'll be our buy-side client that we'll all be pitching to on this, on this session. No. <laughs> Jeff. Hi, my name is Jeff Schmidt. I run Data Pulse. Uh, data Pulse is an alternative uh, data provider. Uh, we specialize in uh, B2B, enterprise software, cloud, and IoT uh, data sets to help uh, uh, the investment community understand uh, these uh, uh, these companies that have historically been kind of tricky to get information about. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in the spirit of the the previous panel, um, we actually uh, during the uh, pres the last presidential election, just for fun, we never did any uh, uh, work for for campaigns. Uh, created a product called uh, Election Pulse, and every week we uh, put a report up, just kind of fun looking at the internet infrastructure usage around um, the candidates themselves, their political action committees. Uh, we had the most fun looking at the pun and parody sites, um, just kind of showcasing you know, some of our capabilities and, 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 and what we can see. And it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. Um, some, of the, uh, um, some of the insights were, were kind of fun uh, for, for a beer later. Are you running one now as well? Um, you know, we haven't decided whether we'll do one for the next campaign. We probably will. Again, it is a, a fun little side project. That's one. Thank you, uh, uh, Dan. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Baruch, currently with URSA. Uh, URSA is a satellite radar-based intelligence company. We create a whole slew of data analytics. Uh, my background is predominantly from the energy trading world, uh, both physical and financial, uh, Morgan Stanley and Glencore, oil, gas, and power, and then uh, Alliance Bernstein, I uh, see some former colleagues in the audience on the alternative investment space, uh, kind of linking both of those worlds with the alternative data space, uh, URSA in particular leveraging satellite radar, which is a relatively new uh, technological capability, traditionally ex-military, ex-government, uh, so it's one of the first times we're leveraging it for, for commercial purposes for folks within the sort of commodities trading or hedge funds, banking, uh, research communities, alternative investment communities. Harvey. Hi, I'm uh, Harvey Stein. I'm head of the Quant Risk Analytics Group at Bloomberg. I've been there uh, 26 years and uh, built a lot of the option pricing models on the system. The, uh, now I'm responsible for the uh, risk models and credit risk and market risk. Um, Bloomberg has some data people use every now and then. And uh, okay. I'm very happy to be here. Before, uh, before I got into finance, I was uh, academic. I got my PhD in uh, mathematics at Berkeley. So, Thank so you. I'm so quite diverse. diverse highly, I'll be highly yeah. technical. <laughs> we'll get to the technicalities. Uh, in terms of from my side, uh, I run independent research on China housing markets as well as a, a research automation business. So let me start with uh, uh, Michael with you um, as our ultimate buyer here. Uh, let me ask you, what has really changed in the last two years in terms of not necessarily alternative data or the data itself, but what is it different today that you can do as the buy side or you cannot do that different from, from two years ago? What's really changed? How has technology progressed? What has enabled you to do? 
Um, right, from, um, from my seat and my experience, um, I think the, the biggest uh, driver of change for us has been just the change in technology and what's available and how we can make use of that to make a, a, a data ingestion mechanism, a, a quality, kind of reliable, repeatable, scalable data mechanism that um, we can put uh, a very high amount of data through, um, both across the breadth of data sets that we're working on, but also across history and being able to deliver uh, a deeply historical data sets in point in time fashion to our, our financial professionals who use it um, at, at a scale and at a pace and with performance that uh, for us would have been a little tough to achieve in the past. Um, the biggest shift from uh, kind of my uh, uh, experience has been just the adoption of a lot of uh, cloud technologies and containerization that has led us to really accelerate the building of the, the data pipeline as well as the scalability and performance. It's just, there's just so much available in terms of tooling and we're so much more effective and efficient at being able to put these components together um, it, that um, has been a really big accelerant and kind of a force multiplier for uh, a technology staff to be able to deliver on these promises and, and keep up with the insatiable demands for data and just more and more um, uh, uh, data that we're uh, you know, being asked to provide and being able to tie it together more effectively and quicker and being able to try things and uh, see if they work and sort of throw stuff up there um, and uh, integrate better with our suppliers and getting the data in-house. Um, the, there's so much available that's already built and we're mostly focused on wiring it together and uh, putting it, uh, kind of assembling out of pre-built components and um, a, a process and a pipeline that um, would have been, would have taken us a lot longer to do and a lot more reinventing of wheels and just kind of spending time on things that are not uh, at core to doing what we're trying to do, but just the underpinnings and the infrastructure. So this has been a big driver. So, sort of like a few other people mentioned on other panels earlier, essentially the even from a startup perspective, the cost of getting into the business with a ready-made infrastructure. Right? We're talking really about AWS and Google Cloud and all those um, uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, let, let's come back to, to that uh, uh, um, in a minute. Now, uh, Jeff, like, why don't we, for, for, for you and, 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 uh, and Daniel, uh, I know you have these sort of interesting cases of, of um, uh, what do we call it, all data or what you do. Um, do you want to just illustrate it through a specific kind of case studies um, and, and explain what, what it is? Yep. Absolutely. Um, just kind of expanding on the, the comment earlier about um, what's changed. You know, we are, we're really in a kind of a golden age of data and, and data science and analytics right now. Um, and I have to do, you know, AI and ML and all the, the buzzwordy stuff. On blockchain. Yeah, blockchain. It cover, cover all the bases. No, but it's because... There, there's an interesting set of circumstances that's happening right now. Storage is effectively free, right, for the first time in the history of computing. Transit is effectively free for the first time in the history of computing. I'm using loose definitions of free, but the cost per is zero. Um, and the tools and the compute to do data science have never been more accessible than they are now. And in particular, you know, tools like R, um, computing power that you can, you know, lease from, from Amazon and, and Azure, and the toolkits, the, the microservices, the building blocks that these guys give you. I mean, we could sit down at the bar over a beer and in 20 or 30 lines of Python code, write and train a, a, a video visual face recognition platform. And I'm not kidding. That's like 20 lines of Python on an Amazon service. I mean, it's, it's amazing what's happening right now. And it's transforming not just science or, or the financial area, but everything we do. It's, it's amazing. I guess, I guess with the caveat, though, that that means it's amazing for everyone, which means Absolutely. it's not unique to anyone, right? So in terms of competitive edge, um, it, does it really so, bring just efficiency? Or? So I guess it's like the key is the use case, right? So you, you have to have very well-defined questions and use cases to apply all of this you know, AI, ML, magic. Um, and in order to get the answers you want, otherwise you're going to get, you know, a garbage model. Anybody can overfit a model and get it to tell you that the sky is purple or, you know, whatever you want. In order to get a good answer, you have to have a reasonable question just to start with. 
Um, the use cases that, that, that we're most familiar, familiar with are um, trying to gain visibility into areas um, that have typically been hard to get visibility into. I'm talking about enterprise software, uh, cloud migration. Um, a lot of alternative data sets so far have been focused on the B2C space. Um, you know, go to, go to a website, download an app, play a game. Um, those are fairly well understood data sets at this point. But if you want to know how, um, how Slack is doing or how Salesforce is doing or who's going to win in the alternative data or the uh, alternative payment space, um, we, haven't, we haven't had good data sets uh, for those yet. And, uh, and so data policy and the, the use cases that we're focusing on is to support fundamental investors with a thesis uh, about these particular spaces. Hey, I think Microsoft is going to kill Slack. Uh, hey, I think uh, Square is going to win in the alternative payment space. These sorts of fundamental questions. You can build KPIs, gather data. You know, hey, how is Slack really doing with upgrades? Um, hey, how is Square really doing with uh, small retailers? And uh, uh, create good, solid questions and, and move from there. And can you can you elaborate a little bit though on because I I would bet from my our earlier conversations not everybody would actually be familiar what you mean by those, like when we mentioned SaaS in that context, so those methods. Can you explain or share a little bit what exactly, how do you, what are the sensors, what are the methods of collection of the data? Sure. So when you're talking about internet data, um, there's a really a finite number of places you can get data from. Um, historically, it's been uh, panels. So think, you know, Nielsen and folks like that that run, uh, you know, panels um, and, and gather data and extrapolate on a population. Um, increasingly, uh, browser bars and other, you know, kind of pseudo spyware uh, sorts of uh, ways to get data um, about where people go. Uh, your ISPs uh, sell data about where, um, uh, you know, where people go uh, on their circuits. Those have been the historical places, and that works, again, pretty well for B2C. You know, if I'm sitting at home, which news site do I use? Which travel site do I use? Um, but that doesn't work really well. Uh, when you want to know how an enterprise is using Salesforce um, or how an enterprise is using uh, Zoom. And so you have to uh, find other ways to, to, to get that data. Um, we use a combination of uh, passive observations uh, and some active observations organized around the internet infrastructure to get visibility into that area. And, and you would presumably so license or semi-exclusively license from those ISPs or those, some of those sources, right? Correct. There's, there's some data that we obtain ourselves. Um, there's some data that we license, there's some data that we purchase. So none of this comes from the actual companies that, that the, the scope covers, right? Correct. So like our, our research on Slack and Zoom, for example, doesn't come from Slack and Zoom. Yeah. So I think let's, let's circle back to this in, 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 a, in a minute. I want to look for some common themes that, that are emerging here. Uh, Can I comment on that? Yeah, Harvey. On I mean, uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of interesting data that can be consumed. The question is what exactly you're going to do with it, how are you going to leverage it, and if we think about who's the best at using data and who is making the most money, it's got to be Google, Facebook with their ad, ad targeting, right? They look at all the data that everybody's, uh, you know, what everybody's clicking on, what you search for. They just bought Fitbit so they can know, you know, how many steps you take every day and whatnot. And, uh, and they send you and they send you ads that they think are appealing. And then you go and you search for a new pair of pants. And for two weeks after that, you see ads for the same pair of pants. It's like a little bit too little too late. And this is, this is, this is kind of the best we've got right now. So I'm a little bit more on the skeptical side about how much you can really do with this data, what you're going to do with it, how you're going to draw conclusions about it. Because you're talking about multidimensional data sets very high dimension, lots of parameters. It's very hard to really understand and see what's going on. You end up building a model, you're running it through these numerical methods that are producing something and it's not clear exactly what. I think, I think to that point, you're absolutely right. It comes down to what are you gonna do? How do you leverage this data? Which takes me back to a point that you made, Jeff, about uh, leveraging software for sort of transparency in opaque markets. That's the same type of intel we're trying to provide, that transparency in opaque markets, but more for physically inclined assets. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you a quick anecdote. So our, our co-founders actually used to launch and uh, build and launch their own satellites. Uh, when they were starting the company, they realized that, you know, the hardware side of the industry isn't where uh, the industry is going, it's the analytics. Uh, so speaking about where do you source the data from, we have 
a very large constellation of vendors, uh, satellite vendors, where we ingest uh, radar images. Again, I mentioned this is sort of an ex-military, ex-government uh, ex type of technology that we're using for commercial purposes. And basically scanning the entire world uh, to create 3D models, essentially 3D measurements of physical assets on the world. Our, our core bread and butter is in the energy sector. So crude oil inventories, the big cylindrical tanks that you can see on the, the Garden State Parkway as you're driving down not too far from here, and doing that at scale using um, basically 3D measurements of the top and the bottom of the tank. And by measuring how full the floating lid of these tanks are, you can tell what are the, what's the sort of supply and demand balance for fundamental trading or the robustness of an economy, for example. Um, if you go on our website, I just published a, a white paper that goes into detail on this, but uh, took a deep dive into what crude oil fundamentals in China, for, for example, just spotlighting China, what does that tell you for the robustness of the Chinese economy? Trying to unearth uh, macro trends, whether it might be uh, leading signals or structural signals for the macroeconomic financial indicators, whether it be uh, global equity indices, the, the Hang Seng, S&P 500, uh, global bond markets, uh, basket of commodities, the BCOM index, for example, uh, gold, are we in a risk on, risk off scenario? There's actually pretty strong leading signals there, uh, but more for the fundamental side of the, the investing community, those who might operate in the sort of energy derivative space, this is exactly what I used to do. Uh, leveraging fundamental data is, is oftentimes difficult to get a handle. Uh, you're dealing with government statistical releases oftentimes that are significantly lagged. Uh, one to two months for certain countries, you're also generally applying geopolitical grains of salt for some of the statistical releases from China or Middle Eastern countries uh, when it comes to oil demand and oil supply. Uh, so it's kind of a time arbitrage opportunity in terms of getting advanced intelligence or kind of a real-time pulse before these statistical releases, but also an unbiased measurement. You know, we're just taking a satellite image and here's a 3D measurement of it. We're not applying any sort of um, you know, bias to it per se from a, from a government perspective. Uh, so in terms of flat price, Brent or WTI price movement or time spreads, uh, looking at physical assets uh, for those covering the energy markets perhaps in the room, the Permian, uh, the big West Texas shale play uh, has gotten a lot of headlines for the last couple of years, huge production growth out of the Permian in terms of supply, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of capital, some folks on the PE side here, uh, a lot of pipeline infrastructure, a lot of export capacity out of the Gulf Coast of the US to global markets. What do those spread relationships mean? So those are all kind of just use cases. To your point, sure. how do you yeah. leverage this for investing? And we also, we also talked earlier, I think, about uh, other domains, right? So real estate could be next. if you track Real estate, so, so one of the other areas that I focus on is what are the sort of strategic directions we want to take the company, other strategic markets we may or may not want to develop. Uh, the gentleman from Alliance Bernstein was talking earlier today about ESG investing and all of the, the difficulties in getting verifiable ground truth uh, you know, is this particular production facility polluting X amount? Is it, does that marry up to what they're saying in the disclosures? The disclosure guidelines are still very vague and immature at this point. Uh, one of the areas that, you know, eyes in the sky can essentially come in and help out is provide that ground truth. Is there environmental degradation around this production facility, you know, in South America? How long has that per persisted for? Uh, creating sort of an unbiased index around that. Har Harvey, so, you. Yeah, so you're bringing up something that I was thinking about is to what extent is this new, new data sources, alternative data and machine learning techniques displacing conventional approaches versus augmenting conventional approaches? What you're, bring, what you're talking about, it sounds like it's more augmentation than displacement, right? Agreed. You still need the basics, you still need the analysis, you still need everything else, and then these additional things can give you a little bit of an edge. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not, not meant to displace any sort of models. It's another variable into an existing uh, strategic uh, thesis or model that you may already have, yeah. So there, there's an old joke in the, I'm a pilot, and there's an old joke in the pilot community. It's, you know, basically, if you run into a pilot, give them two minutes and they'll tell you they're a pilot. That's us and CrossFit people and vegans, I think. Um, so, um, w one of the, to, to that effect, one of the, the analogies that I like a lot is how the National Weather Service does forecasting. There's models and models and models, and in, and in fact, some of the most sophisticated models in existence are meteorological models with supercomputing behind them and all sorts of stuff. But forecasting comes from a human that looks at all the models, 
and then we'll think about things. You know, well, you know, the GFS model sometimes tends to overplay lake effect snow early in the season on Lake Michigan. And, and you know, this human interpretation on top is really important. You can't just let the machines take over. Um, you need the human. And that's how we find our data used. Our data is used by fundamental analysts that look at our data like, hey, you know what? We're seeing an uptick in Teslas in Japan in this particular you know, model or in this particular research. How does that factor in? Do we think that agrees, et cetera? Right. That's, uh, that's a great example. No, I just okay. forgot what I was going to say, so I'll, I'll, I'll get come back, back to, to you. Come back that. to you on this. Uh, when we talk about uh, satellites, uh, let's give it deeper because I also believe that you talk about the use of radar, and I'm not sure if like I wasn't familiar sure. with all the distinction. Oh, Can yeah. you do a brief educational yeah. thirty seconds? On well, Can I just jump in again? Because yeah. I, re I remember what I was going to say. I mean, it was a great example about the weather because uh, we have the uh, the uh, what is it called the, the uh, NOAA right National uh, Weather. Basically, they you know, the government dumped tons of money into trying to understand the weather and predict the weather and measure the weather. And uh, post Dodd-Frank, there was uh, the formation of the Office of Financial Research, which was supposed to do something similar for the economy. Now, unfortunately, that never really took off. So we're in a situation, but then you can also ask the question whether it would e even really work. Mm -hmm. Because when you're talking about the weather, you're talking about a physical system governed by physical laws, these physical laws don't change over time. When you're talking about financial data, you have constant change. These, these aren't stationary processes. They aren't governed by physical laws. Different things happen over time, and, and there are different impacts. And one thing happened 20 years ago, it has a different impact today. And there's human beings acting like irrational human beings. So uh, back, Daniel, to you on, on the uh, yeah, 30 seconds I, on the radar. I, I was in your shoes in the audience not too long ago. I, I don't come from a technical background or have any experience in satellites. So um, uh, coming up to speed on that was, was important, getting educated in it. Uh, if you look back maybe eight to 10 years ago, uh, the satellite space in terms of commercial application was generally limited to what's known as optical, which is kind of like your camera, uh, your phone taking a picture of Earth looking down. Um, unfortunately, to get insights into relatively uh, opaque areas, oftentimes, depending on the market or the intel you're trying to get, it could be in regions that are oftentimes dealing with uh, weather variability or cloud coverage. I believe the stat is at any given point, two-thirds of Earth is covered in cloud coverage. So if you're looking at China, for example, or uh, you know jungle areas in South America, Good luck getting real, real valuable intel, though. You're oftentimes dealing with disparate data points and interpolation strategies between that. Uh, but if you, if you look back maybe five, six years ago, uh, what we leverage is a type of radar called synthetic aperture radar. Uh, it's called SAR. It basically leverages the capability to penetrate through clouds or work 24-7, day or night, uh, so you don't have to deal with disparate data points. And that's where we've created um, essentially uh, weekly coverage of oil inventories right now around around the world to create that kind of consistent data set. But obviously that's one use case for the energy markets. It could be leveraged for, you know, uh, endless uh, endless use cases for other markets as well. Real estate we were talking about, if you're trying to find insights into construction activity in China, for example, might not be the easiest thing to do given, you know, fog or smog coverage for, that could last for six, six weeks straight and you may not have that visibility and that might be missing out on a potential investment opportunity, perhaps. And in interestingly, if it could be augmented with the actual data to verify all the published construction, the difference between completions and new starts, right? That's where... Yeah, the more contextual information, obviously, the better. We, we obviously have the, the capability to, to penetrate and see in areas that are oftentimes more difficult. You know, flying a drone in China is not going to really work too often. Uh, but uh, we're also doing some other pretty interesting things on the ship tracking side. Um, for those, you know, T tuned into the Iranian sanction environment, uh, uh, at least in the energy markets, there's a capability to track ships called AIS. It's, uh, it's oftentimes used by you know, Bloomberg and other folks who are able to tap into this and track real-time location or destinations of vessels tied to BLs, bills of lading as well, uh, what's on the cargoes. But it's easy for a captain to just flip that off. And it could just be for operational reasons. It could be for nefarious reasons. Uh, but finding that through radar capabilities basically makes them uh, quite visible, even though they may be dark to the rest of the just, market. Which is quite a progress. And I, I live in Hong Kong, and, and you know, it was 20, 30 years ago. People did alternative data there by standing on a hill 
and watching the, the container ships leaving and counting the containers and the depth of the water uh, to get a proxy for trade, right? So uh, in that sense, uh, things have evolved. Um, uh, Harvey, you had, you had a point? Um, well, we're gonna, I was going to maybe bring up some of the risks side of things since I've been thinking about risk a, lo a lot. Um, right, I mean, how you use these things are going to be also be governed by regulations. You know, we're in a regulated industry. Well, maybe less so in the hedge fund world than other places, but uh, we've seen a, a big growth in regulation. Um, and you have to think about what these models are doing and how they're doing it. Because a lot of them, it's pretty opaque what exactly they're doing. You're not kind of hand tuning to a small number of factors, you're using a lot of data, a lot of factors, and uh, you're fitting some very complicated model. The end result may in fact have illegal biases. Right, if you talk in certain, certain spaces, you talk about loan origination, for example, where you have, uh, where you can't, uh, you, uh, <clears throat> you know, you can't uh, make loans depending on race, creed, or color, or gender for that matter, right? And uh, what if your model, you're not feeding these factors to your model, but your model is deducing them and acting accordingly? Then you're potentially tripping up against the law. The algorithm biases, I, because earlier there was a lot of talk about risk of around the data around GDPR privacy compliance, but we haven't really heard so much about the actual risk of uh, the models themselves, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot, of, a lot of questions you have to ask. If you're using these models, how do you risk manage it? <clears throat> how do you know they're doing what they're doing? How do you know they're not going to act funny when something weird happens or something even not so weird happens? So, right. so we, did we build, we, we tried building some models for uh, using uh, machine learning techniques for uh, loss given default. And it turned out the models looked uh, like they were doing great. You run the standard tests like the, uh, like, uh, the K-fold uh, cross-validation test, and everything looks great, looks good in sample, looks good out of sample, and then you start inspecting deeper and you say, well, what does this model really look like? Can I graph what the surface that it's generating? Can I graph the function that it's predicting? And you find out that it's doing ridiculous stuff. It's basically just massively overfit to the data. And when you understand what the functional form of these models are, you can understand why it's doing that. And if you don't get to that level, then you know, it's like, you know, it's like uh, kids playing with bombs. This, th this is an important risk. It's, I, I think we're moving away from, instead of closer to, in general, actually understanding what's happening under the hood with these models. So, you know, somebody that uses, you know, Azure's AI toolkit or Google TensorFlow or, you know, any of the auto ML stuff that, you know, will apply 700 models and give you the top four, like, nobody really understands what these things are doing under the covers. Um, and, and that creates all those problems. Also, in, in the rest of my life, I deal in the, the information security field. And I'd say that the bad guys are figuring out how to intentionally, uh, um, you know, create right, um, false models for fraud and, and security well, applications. That's, that's, uh, that's another it's one of the problems, area. right? A lot of the models are very fragile. Yeah. They're very brittle. Yeah. You find, uh, you know, even in one of the spaces where, which has had the most progress, the most success in machine learning, namely image recognition. Right, there are articles about how you can just doctor an image slightly, and, and the, you know what the machine thought was a person now it thinks it's a toaster. Mm -hmm. like, I remember right. there was a classic example the, where the machine was dog? was learning uh, actually through the background of the images and the recognizing yeah. pattern through that to detect criminals because of the background of the yeah. photo rather than the images themselves. Wasn't there a nerdy TV show that had the "Is it a hot dog" app? Or uh, I, I, yeah, there we go. Sean, I'm a nerd there. Um, uh, so, uh, now, this may be a good point to turn back to Michael, to you. So, you're listening to this, right, from the buyer of, of all those guys and what we provide. Uh, what questions come to your mind? Um, what, what, what hopes and, and fears uh, when you look at these, these kind of um, data sets or models presented to you? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think uh, um, a lot of the points that were brought up, of course, are very important. Um, a lot of the questions um, uh, will come for me would be, you know, how do I make these things come together? Um, and and uh, uh, each, each one of these, as you pointed out, uh, potentially 
is a, a something that can augment a process that exists or where multiple different uh, data sets uh, from pretty different ends of the spectrum can come together to inform something else. Um, and, um, and, and if we're looking at them from the standpoint of uh, uh, bringing things together from different participants in the, in the data uh, offering space, um, then you know, how do we do that? Uh, what's, uh, um, what's going to be helpful to me in order to assemble things out of these disparate parts and how do I think about um, the, the concepts that are being represented in the data uh, in such a way that will make it more easy to operate with, standardized. Um, how do I think about um, history and um, proving their efficacy across a historical time horizon and testing and a lot of the, um, some of the newer satellites up there probably haven't been circling the Earth for as long as we would have preferred. Um, so um, th there's a, always a question of how far back can we look at this data and is it the same going deeper into history or is it something else before and, and will that uh, affect how we're thinking about testing it. Um, so for us, it's, it's a lot of questions like that, and um, plus a bunch of the mundane, uh, you, know, what, you know, how do we prove that it's accurate? How do we prove it's day-to-day -day quality? Um, how do we um, actually, you know, um, uh, how do we think about just physical delivery and assembly and, and things like that? But um, yeah, uh, the most interesting thing to think about, I think, is there's so many uh, participants in the data space and so many different offerings, and they're all really cool and really exciting, potentially. Uh, of course, the question is, uh, what's the application? But also, you know, how do we pick and choose these different things and put them together in a meaningful way, and would that be possible? So, uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, you know, when, when we look at initiating coverage on a, on a new ticker or when we're talking to, to, to clients, um, when you look at a data set, there's exactly three possibilities. Um, either there's no signal at all, it's just garbage. Um, there is signal, but it's not measuring what you think it is, or there is signal and it's measuring what you think it is. Um, and, and figuring that out and being you know, kind of honest about it um, is, is really important. Um, not every data set works for every problem, and you, know, you have to be able to, to figure that out and move on. Um, Going back to the, the election pulse example for a second, so we had a, a fascinating experience with that, you know, what, three years ago. Um, when, when we were looking at the election, uh, the, the infrastructure around the candidates, um, the, everything associated with the Trump campaign um, tremendously underperformed every other candidate by multiple orders of magnitude. And in particular, when we got to the general election and we were tracking um, all the infrastructure associated with the Clinton campaign and all the infrastructure associated with the Trump campaign, like it wasn't even close. Um, the, the activity associated with the Clinton campaign was orders of magnitude, uh, higher than, than the Trump campaign. Well, okay, that's, that's fine. Obviously, we know what happened with the election. Of course, at the end of the day, we weren't measuring who people were gonna vote for or that they were gonna vote or that they cared or whatever, we were measuring, you know, we have a theory now that your average Clinton voter may very well have gone to the website and researched, you know, her opinions on economic policy and environmental this, that, or the other thing. Your average Trump voter may not have gone to a website and done a lot of research about Trump's views on economic policy and this, that, and the other thing. It was, there was a measurement there, it wasn't the one that we thought it was. So, so let me, before we move to the next part, uh, and conscious of time, let me just try to summarize what we are saying here. So from the buy side perspective, what's really changed is the cloud, operational efficiency, how you're able to bring more stuff together at a more efficient, fast, at lower cost, right? Then we have like two very exciting domain-specific uh, possibilities, one on the satellite side with radar, right, in, in sort of less transparent markets. We have... Um, uh, the alternative source of data on the technology firms with SaaS, IoT, and, and other sensors. Um, Harvey was talking about the risks associated with the use of that, which you echo in terms of questions, concerns about practicality and how to operationalize that, right? Um, and let me now um, move to the, the next part, last part, which uh, really just, just about technology itself. So let, let's separate a little bit from those specific data cases. And there is a lot of exciting developments uh, uh, out there. 
um, I want to throw in quantum, um, the generalized AI, and so on. But let me actually throw it to, to Harvey. So you've been, um, I promise I won't use the quarter of a century okay. thing, but you've been with Bloomberg for, forever, uh -huh. and you've seen various waves of technologies. What actual underlying technologies do you think are really happening, coming up, that people should watch? Well, uh, in terms of technology, I think what we see is that everything old is new again, right? You're talking about, you just mentioned cloud services, right? I mean, so how, how does cloud really differ from time sharing that we had pre-PC era, right? We went from, from time sharing where everybody's using some big central computer to everybody using PCs to everybody going to some big central server again, except that server's made out of PCs. Well, okay, so what? You know, you're using internet technology. You're talking about, you know, you're, you're doing, you're connecting to machines over the internet using TCP IP, which is a protocol that was developed in the 70s. It's like some of this stuff is really old. Sometimes it takes a long, long time before it becomes useful. I think what's ubiquitous now is just the level of communication, right? The big change we've seen since the, uh, which we'll be talking about, I guess, on the next panel more, but uh, I guess I could give a little bit of a, uh, preview. And second. Right? The, the big thing that, that you see now is since, since, uh, since the uh, dot-com bubble in uh, 2000, the turn of the century, right, what do we have now? We have everybody connecting over the internet, right? It's the new, it's the new transport mechanism for, for information and communication. And it's, it's made the ability for one person to talk to many orders of magnitude cheaper, right? So that, and, and if you think about what's going on now, a lot of it, I think, is just ramifications of that one fact. I think my, one, one could say maybe also about, it's about adoption. It's, you know, coming from Asia, it's a different bit of perspective, but there's a huge revolution in payments there, right? The reason PBOC is introducing partly the digital currency, everything is concerned about those two companies owning all the payment scheme. In Indonesia, all the games about grab it's all about payments and data coming out and of that. It's all right. enabled by every household and every phone and every person being connected over the internet. So let's take that as one, one thing. Now, um, anybody wants to comment or is closer familiar with the quantum physics or computing and the prospects for that? Well, the funny thing about quantum is that we've been three to four years away from a viable quantum prototype for about 15 years now. Right. Um, that being said, you know, when it does happen, it's gonna be um, game changing, but in a lot of kind of esoteric ways. Um, things like cryptography, um, you know, will be tremendously affected um, in, but the IETF and others are already starting to think about, um, you know, kind of quantum resistant algorithms but the historical communications, um, things that adversaries have written down, hoping that someday they'll be able to decrypt it all, um, that, that will become available. That has interesting implications. Mm -hmm. um, things like fitting models will become instantaneous, theoretically. Um, so, you know, it's a, quantum is exciting. It's not as close, you know, we're not like right on the edge like everybody sometimes kind of thinks we are, but it'll happen in our lifetime, um, and it will be interesting. Harvey, you want to add well, to yeah, well, just, you know, what you brought up is exactly right, I think, about, uh, you know, every, you know it's, it's, been, it's been coming, it's going to be, you know, five years in the future for the last 15 years. You know, just like uh, fusion, just like fusion reactors, self-driving cars, right? I mean, since, uh, you know, you can, since uh, almost the dawn of the computer age, it's just been... Each technology they came in is like a new toy and everybody gets all excited. And then you see it kind of disappears one way or another. And does anybody remember 4GLs? Those were fourth generation languages. Uh, very popular, everybody was designing them back in the 80s. It was gonna replace all the programmers. You weren't gonna need programmers because it would be so easy to write code in a 4GL. Well, yeah, didn't happen, did it? I think we have a consistent, have consistent message from Harvey of a healthy dose of skepticism here from, from, from experience. Uh, I think one, one other use of 
quantum, where I, I think that there there are some some hopes that they, they add more qubits to the sort of thing is is the in the handling of graph, an ability to solve more complex uh, relationships, which is impossible to compute effectively today. So maybe those incremental changes are more likely than than teleporting you to to your plane. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I think that's right. But we have to be again. You know, we've we've been talking quite a bit about the whole garbage in, garbage out problem with with models. Right, so if you can, you know, throw a pile of data at, you know, some quantum thingamajigger and and get a, you know, a, a, a model out of it with, you know, a really high correlation coefficient or however you want to measure it, that might be great, but it might also be an overfit piece of garbage, and so you have to understand what you're actually measuring. Uh, Mike, then uh, any other sort of technologies on your mind, or maybe what things are you, is, that you are looking at or thinking might make a difference in the next few years? Well, no, I just have more of a question. I, um, in, in your example of, of things that have been talked about for quite some time, um, it, it's starting to feel like, from a quantum, on the quantum topic specifically, that yes, it's still out in the future, but it's less, it's a shorter five years than the five years uh, that was predicted before. Uh, but I wanted to get a sense of whether you think that's true, or whether you think it's just, well, we actually are not planning to get there. We're just, we're get going to get there, but not in five years, because that's what we've been saying for a long time. It feels that way. I don't know whether that's the case. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm skeptical. Hey, I'm a security guy, and security guys are always kind of crusty. Um, and skeptical and angry all the time and grumpy. But, but this would be um, the one thing that would really worry the security I, guys. <laughs> With a smile, though. I, um, I, I, uh, I started my career as a developer at Microsoft in 1994. And Microsoft Research was working on Quantum in 1994. And they were sure that they were a couple years away from it in 1994. Um, that was about five years ago? About five years ago, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's it, plus or minus. It's, it's kind of hard for me to, you know, it's going to happen at some point. I don't know when. Probably. Right. So uh, we uh, we still have just a few minutes left. I, I wonder if uh, there are any uh, quick comments or, or maybe questions in the room. Uh, but aware of uh, we're getting close closer and closer to the entertainment time. Uh, so let me uh, uh, just as a as a closing remark ask everybody on the panel to like. Considering all of that skepticism uh, in the back uh, of your mind, but um, say you know we meet here in a year, will we see any new topics on this kind of panel in a year's time, Harvey? Well, I mean, getting back to uh, what you were asking, Michael, I think <clears throat> people are going to focus on what they don't know and look for ways of resolving some of that uh, uncertainty. Right, anything that you're worried about or concerned about or not sure which way, which way it goes, you know, you're looking at a company and analyzing and say, well, you know, I don't have all the information, I'm not sure about this, you can, might be able to find other, other data sources that could help. I think you can think about credit card receipts, which you might get access to. You can think of other things, uh, store entrance and exits that you could get, potentially get access to. These are things that additional information that you could apply that would be very helpful. So you have to think about what you're worried about, how, how you might measure something that, that would help, and see if, that, if you can get at that data. So new, new types of sources that we may be discussing by the time with availability of data. We're almost out of time, so very quickly, um, uh, Daniel, Jeff, Mike. Just, uh, just one thing I'll add. I mean, I know we have a lot of investment folks in the room. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the Reuters article this week. Uh, I mean, there are billions and billions of dollars being, uh, of capital being invested into the satellite space. Uh, the Reuters article was uh, showing a consensus of multiple banks that are anticipating within the next 10 to 20 years, this space will be in the, uh, in the next trillion dollar market. So I do think between the hardware that's going out there and being invested in, uh, the ability to, to visualize the physical earth and understand it a lot better and thus make more better fundamental decisions. I think that has a bright future in front of it. So, so in your satellite area, Jeff, quickly. I think this time next year, we will see a more developed, robust uh, middle market for data VAR, value-add data services. So not enough data scientists. Data scientists are too expensive, too much data, lots of hedge funds. We'll see service providers emerge that provide 
that middle. So more about the structure of the, how the yeah. industry evolves. And Mike, what do you Yeah, do? I was actually going with something pretty similar. I think there's a, I mean, we're starting to see that and there's so much that can be done to data, the explosion of data and all the types of things that are available, people are talking about, and it's all sound very exciting and very cool, uh, getting some help uh, with it and getting it uh, you know, processed into um, something that's a little more usable or put together or, or, or tagged, annotated and parsed and married with some other uh, components of data in, in a way that will make it a m more of a ready-made product from which you can then look at, does it have any signal um, and, and let you skip ahead on all of those steps that you have to do before you can ask these questions that you mentioned earlier. Um, they're, they're, we're starting to see that there'll be more of that. I think it's a pretty big space. And I would just say for me, I, I think we might hear more about human aspect of information and how our neural networks are fed <laughs> through different feeds. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, let's wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Thanks.